Chapter 16 is the shortest and final chapter in the Gospel of Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought aromatic spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. They had been asking each other who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled back. Then as they went into the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, even Peter, that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Then they went out and ran from the tomb, for terror and bewilderment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's the end of Mark's Gospel. The idea of going to anoint a body after burial is contrived. This was a practice done before burial, not after, and this is a plot device that Mark is using in order to arrange for the body to be found missing. Mark goes to some lengths and uses this strained plot device to arrange for the missing body to be discovered, and then he has no post-resurrection appearances. Contrast this with Paul's account. Paul makes no mention whatever of the fate of the body. He simply says he was buried, and on the third day he rose. The resurrection is evidenced, as you would expect, by post-death appearances. So why does Mark use this disappearing body rather than post-death appearances? I go into this in more detail in my video on the empty tomb, but briefly, to my mind, this tends to point towards mythicism, because it suggests that Mark's priority was not to establish the fact of Jesus' resurrection, but rather to answer the question, what happened to the body? And if he was motivated to answer that question, it suggests that something he had said in his gospel raised it. One obvious thing he said that could have raised it was that Jesus was a real person. Raising this to a previously mythicist church would pose the question, what happened to the body? Another point is that in verse 7, Peter is singled out. The young man said, go tell his disciples, even Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. Jesus had said that he would meet them after being raised from the dead in chapter 14, immediately before predicting Peter's denial. And then Peter's singled out here. Why Peter in particular? Is it just a rub salt into Peter's wound, or is it because what Peter has actually been denying will be proven to him in Galilee? Anyway, that's not the end of Mark's Gospel in your Bible. There are another few verses with a footnote saying these verses are absent from the earliest and best manuscripts. That statement is true but slightly misleading. What they mean by the earliest and best manuscripts are the two codices, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. In 177 AD, Bishop Irenaeus, in his work Against Heresies, cites Mark 16 verse 19, so the longer ending clearly originates early, probably within the 2nd century, as does another shorter ending. Many Christians do not agree with the scholarly consensus to leave these passages out, and both the Sinai and Vatican codices have been attacked as possible forgeries. In the case of the Sinai Codex, that's quite a well-developed theory. It was discovered in the middle of the 19th century by Constantine Tischendorf at St Catherine's Orthodox Monastery in the Sinai, but his account of its discovery is, well, not believable. He apparently found parchment sheets from it in a basket waiting to be thrown in the fire. He came away from the monastery on his first visit with several of these sheets, and it looks as though he extracted them from the library by nefarious means and used this as a cover to indicate that the monks didn't value them, which was clearly a lie. They did. The current library, with the longest period of continuous operation in the world, is the Vatican Library, where the Codex Vaticanus was found. The one with the second longest period of operation is this one in St Catherine's Monastery, which is why Tischendorf went there. In the 19th century, a credible claim was made by Constantine Simonides that he had written out the Codex Sinaiticus himself. He was a 19th century paleographer and there is no doubt that he was a consummate expert. It has long been suspected that he was a particularly accomplished forger as well. This is a complex and interesting debate. It's mainly Christians sensitive to the theological consequences of the differences between biblical texts who are sufficiently motivated to delve into this matter. 
One of the best treatments is from David Daniels of Chick Publications, and I give links to some of his videos in the comments below. He is an apologist and does have an agenda to challenge the primacy of these codices. And I'm not saying I agree with his conclusions, but I recommend his videos as a starting point if you're interested in this topic. Most ancient manuscripts contain the longer ending of Mark. A few contain the shorter ending, and Vatican and Sinai have neither, and are currently thought to be the original versions of Mark. Anyway, here are first the shorter and then the longer ending of Mark. The shorter ending. I'll include verse 8 for context. Then they went out and ran from the tomb, for terror and bewilderment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. But they reported briefly to Peter and those with him all that they had been told. And after this, Jesus himself sent out by means of them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. The longer ending... Then they went out and ran from the tomb, for terror and bewilderment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Early on the first day of the week, after he arose, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had driven out seven demons. She went out and told those who were with him while they were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After this he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were on their way to the country. They went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Then he appeared to the eleven themselves while they were eating, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him resurrected. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The one who believes is baptised and will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new languages, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and whatever poison they drink will not harm them. They will place their hands on the sick and they will be well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. They went out and proclaimed everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word through the accompanying signs. So you can see that both the shorter and the longer ending are pretty suspect internally. For one thing, they immediately contradict verse 8. The longer ending mentions the eleven apostles, where Mark has nothing at all to say about the fate of Judas. That comes from other traditions. Also in the longer ending, there's a reference to speaking in new languages, which looks as though it's derived from Acts, which hadn't been written yet. So to my mind, both the shorter and longer endings are suspect, irrespective of what you think of the two codices. And that ends the Gospel of Mark.